right, check, check. Testing one, two, three. Check, check. One, two, three. Test, test. All right, good morning, St. Paul's. Uh, and good morning to everybody uh, watching on live stream as well. Uh, a couple quick announcements to start us off. Uh, first, welcome back into our space. It's been a long time since many of us have seen the inside of here. So I don't know about you, but uh, I do feel good being back in our space. This is good. Um, so a couple things to keep in mind. Please wear your masks all the time. Make sure they cover your whole face. That's very important. We want anybody who comes here to be able to feel safe. And so uh, that is key to accomplishing that. And uh, also try to keep you know, a little extra feet of distance from people who are not from your household. It's OK. We encourage you to talk to one another, but just you know, try to be mindful of that personal space bubble. Um, the Life to the Full seminar that I've been announcing for the last few uh, weeks has uh, started. It's two weeks in, and uh, Dr. Brad Wright has been teaching the first three weeks of the class, which are on purpose, living purposefully. And the last four weeks of the class um, is going to be led by Cindy Felkel and myself, and we're going to be focusing on gifting. You know, where, what are your strengths? And so if you're still interested in participating and you want an uh, opportunity to take the Clifton Strength Finders test for free, which helps to identify uh, out of a list of 40 what your top five strengths are, uh, if you still want an opportunity to take that, there's still time to sign up, but this is your last week to do that. So uh, please let me know if you're interested. You can email me at ryan at stpaulswired.org. And uh, finally, it's that time of year, even though uh, we're in the midst of a pandemic, we are still doing Operation Christmas Child. Um, I know Gladys would definitely not want me to forget that. I hope you're watching, Gladys. Uh, so collection week is November 16th through the 23rd. So you have some time, uh, about a month, and uh, there are boxes in the back of the room. Uh, they look like this. And you can grab one, you fill it up with, um, there's a list on the website of the kind of things that they want you to put in this box. But you're basically uh, providing uh, kids who are underprivileged uh, somewhere across the world uh, with Christmas gifts and an opportunity to hear the gospel. Uh, so this is something we've done for many years. We encourage you to participate uh, Collection Week, November 16th through 23rd. And if you want more information, you can uh, check the what's happening. There's a, a blurb at the bottom that explains uh, ways that you can do this. You can even do it online if you prefer. And uh, if you uh, have any other questions, just email myself or Keith. All right, let's uh, rise together. Uh, stand if you are able as we prepare our hearts for worship. Uh, hear these words from 1 Chronicles 29, 10 through 13. Uh, get them. Praise to you, O Lord, God of our Father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things, and your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. Lord, may that be the attitude of our hearts as we come before you in worship now. Uh, Lord, we invite your spirit to move uh, among us and in our hearts we pray, Lord, that we would encounter you this morning, that you would be pleased with our attitude uh, as we exalt you and worship you as our creator and our savior. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, St. Paul's.
guys. All right, it's been a long time since I've been able to use slides. This is exciting for me. <laughs> so uh, if you were here with us last week, you know that after a seven-month hiatus, we finally returned to the book of Revelation. And we uh, picked up where we left off in Revelation 12 with the vision of the woman and the dragon this vision of spiritual warfare. And uh, this week we're continuing in Revelation 13. So if you have a Bible, I encourage you to turn there, although there will also be slides. So, um, Now, <clears throat> when people think about Revelation, there's usually certain concepts that come to mind. Even people who are uh, not believers, if they have a passing familiarity with Revelation, certain concepts come up, like... The Antichrist, the Mark of the Beast, 666, the New World Order, right? These things sound familiar, right? right? Hopefully. <laughs> okay, well, this is a passage where a lot of those ideas find their uh, roots. And so hopefully that piques your interest. Uh, before we get into it, let's say a quick prayer. Lord, we thank you uh, for the ability to gather together right now, and uh, we just ask that you'd help us right now to focus on your word. Uh, Lord, spark our curiosity, uh, help us to recognize and appreciate the richness of what we're about to look at, and we just pray that your spirit would speak to us through it. And we pray, Lord, that we might also um, uh, become more, more uh, clear about what this is all about. Um, there's a lot of confusion surrounding this book, and we pray, Lord, that you would help us to think about it well. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so just like last week, I'm going to read the whole passage, and it's going to be confusing, it's going to be weird, but just let it wash over you, and then we'll go back and look at it more closely. And the dragon stood on the shore of the sea. And I saw a beast coming out of the sea. He had ten horns and seven heads with ten crowns on his horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was astonished and followed the beast. Men worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast, and they also worshipped the beast and asked, Who is like the beast? Who can make war against him? 
The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise his authority for 42 months. He opened his mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name in his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. He was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. And he was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the book of life belonging to the lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. He who has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity he will go. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword he will be killed. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of the saints. Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. He exercised all the authority of the first beast on his behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. And he performed great and miraculous signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to earth in full view of men. Because of the signs he was given power to do on behalf of the first beast, he deceived the inhabitants of the earth. He ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. He was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that it could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. He also forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. This calls for wisdom. If anyone has insight, let him calculate the number of the beast. For it is man's number. His number is 666. Whew, okay. Um, back to the top. The dragon stood on the shore of the sea. Now remember, Revelation was written to real churches in the first century. And it was a revelation that John wrote down, and then it was sent out to these churches. Uh, hopefully you remember that when we started reading Revelation last fall, it began with seven letters to seven churches. And this is a picture of where uh, the seven churches were in Asia Minor, that uh, one in the water. That's Patmos, which is the island that John would have been writing from. He was in exile in, in Patmos. And what, what I want us to notice is that the cities go in order of what the postal route would be at the time. In Revelation, they are addressed in the order of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. And that's the same route that if somebody was carrying that letter and bringing it to each location, that's the route they would take. So a lot of the time, people interpret Revelation so that each church represents a certain time period in history and that sort of thing. And all of that is extremely speculative. Okay, it's important for us to remain grounded in the text. This was a letter that was sent to real people in the first century in, in Asia Minor. So for these churches, when they heard the dragon stood on the shore of the sea, what sea are they going to think about? They're going to think about this big body of water that's to the west of them, which was the Aegean Sea. Now, if we zoom out here, I know that's really hard to see. Um, do I have a laser pointer? I do. I've never used that before. Okay, so see, this is where we were just looking at. This is Asia Minor. And here's the Aegean Sea. So if you're on Asia Minor and you're looking in this direction, you are looking in the direction of Rome. This is the base of the Roman Empire. Now, all this land that's in color, that's the Roman Empire. So it's enormous, okay? And here's where the churches were in Asia Minor, and they're looking at the, the sea. If they're looking at the sea, they're looking in, in the direction of Rome. So when John says the dragon stood on the shore of the sea, that is a symbolic way of saying Satan is about to mount an attack on the church from the direction of Rome. Does it make sense? Okay, let's keep reading. And I saw a beast coming out of the sea. He had ten horns and seven heads with ten crowns on his horns, and on each head a blasphemous, blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, and he had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. Now, who is this beast that rises out of the sea? 
Well, if you've been tracking with what I've been saying so far, it makes sense to think of this, this beast as the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire rising up from the direction of the Aegean Sea. Now, there's a ton of symbolism in this, in this passage, and we do not have time to look at, at all of it. I'm not even going to attempt it, but I do want to say one thing. Notice how the, the beast, the Roman Empire, is described as having uh, parts that resemble a leopard, parts that resemble a bear and a lion. Very strange, right? What's that about? Well, last week I talked about how Revelation is the New Testament book that references the Old Testament the most. Two-thirds of the verses in Revelation make reference to the Old Testament. And this is one of those times. Uh, this is imagery that's being drawn from the book of Daniel. If you want to look at it more closely, it's from Daniel chapter 7. And Daniel had this vision where different oppressive empires throughout human history were represented by these different animals. Leopard, bear, lion. And what John does is he combines all of them into one beast. So what he's saying is that the Roman Empire has the same oppressive spirit of empire as these other wicked empires throughout history, like Babylon. That's, that's the idea that he's getting at here. Now, even though the Roman Empire is no longer around today, that particular beast is gone, we should recognize that the spirit that John is talking about here, the spirit of oppressive empire, is still at work in the world today, and it will be at work in the future, and it's going to be at work until Christ returns in, in different forms. And whenever there's that spirit of oppressive empire, we need to recognize that ultimately it is Satan, the dragon, who is behind it. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm using this phrase, the spirit of empire. What do I mean by that? Well, here is how I would describe the spirit of empire. The spirit of empire, and just so you know, I'm drawing this from my whole study of Revelation. This is a summary um, that I have come up with, and I, I mean, I'm not the only one that thinks this way. But anyway, this is my Ryan Spooner summary of the spirit of empire summarizing the, ho the whole of Revelation. Uh, the spirit of empire is the attitude that says three things matter most. Three things matter most. One, loyalty to the empire. Two, military power. And three, money. Loyalty to the empire, military power, and money. Now, these things are not in, of, in and of themselves evil. But if you have no values that are higher than these, then the dragon has free reign to work through them. Does that make sense? If we have no values above these, the dragon will work through them. Satan will work through them. If we value loyalty to country more than doing what is right, we will justify whatever benefits our nation, even if it comes at great expense to other places in the world. Right? Uh, if we value military power more than what is moral or what is good, uh, well, then we're just going to be drawn to whoever has the most uh, biggest bombs and the most guns, and we're going to value that more than what's right and what's good, right? And similarly, if we value money more than what's right, we're, we're going to end up harming people. We're going to end up probably harming the environment, right? Because the only thing we really care about is the bottom line, how much profit are we making? That's the spirit of empire, when we allow those three values to be the supreme values. So, the beast represents the spirit of empire, and specifically, uh, that spirit being represented in the Roman Empire at the time. All right, let's keep reading. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have a fatal wound but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was astonished and followed the beast. Men worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast. And they also worshipped the beast and asked, Who is like the beast? Who can make war against him? See that 
ultimate value of whoever is just the most powerful, right? Who can make war against him? He's the strongest. Not that he's the most moral, the most good, but he's the most powerful. All right, so there's a lot going on here. What is, what is this saying? Well, remember, my second rule of interpreting Revelation is that it's hard and we have to be humble. And I want to acknowledge that well-intentioned Christians have interpreted this in different ways. So if you grew up as an American evangelical, there's a very good chance that the interpretation you've heard of this passage is that one day in the future, a world leader is going to come who is going to exert tremendous influence. He's going to become uh, ruler over the entire world. And uh, he's going to demand worship of him. And something's going to happen where it's going to seem like he died, but he didn't actually die. He comes back. And people are going to be even more inspired to worship, worship him because of this false resurrection. So that's one way that this is interpreted. Now, I think it's entirely possible that that sequence of events will take place in the future. I definitely think that's possible. Um, and if a world leader ever seems to die and then comes back to life, I'm going to be suspicious. <laughs> um, however, it is also possible that this is simply referring to something that happened in the first century. And if you know my tendency for interpretation, I lean towards that perspective. Because this is a real letter written to real churches in the first century. Uh, so, if that's the case, what is this talking about? Well, about 20 years before Revelation was written, there was this really bad emperor named Emperor Nero. He was the first emperor to really persecute the Christians. And Emperor Nero died. And when he died, the whole empire was really thrown into turmoil. And Nobody was sure whether the Roman Empire would survive that political turmoil. There was a very brief spirit, uh, period of time where four different people claimed to be the emperor, and they each killed the previous person who was claiming to be the emperor. So it was chaos, and it looked like that whole empire that I showed you on the map earlier was about to just fall apart. Uh, but it didn't. Things turned around. This emperor came along named Vespasian, who kind of pulled things together. And after the Roman Empire pulled it together, there started to be rumors that Nero's going to come back. And that might have been taken literally, like Nero is literally going to come back. But I suspect what was meant by that was something more like the spirit of Nero, of Nero that same kind of leadership, is going to return. And it did. Uh, Domitian, who was the guy who was emperor when this was written, bad dude. Okay. And there were other emperors after him who were also uh, very evil. And so this passage might be describing that series of events, right? The beast who is the Roman Empire, suffered what seemed to be a fatal wound when Nero died. Uh, but the spirit of Nero is living on in other emperors similarly controlled by the dragon. Okay. All right. So whichever one you prefer, we don't have to break fellowship over that. We can, we can all follow Jesus together, whatever interpretation uh, you subscribe to there. But I do lean towards the view that this is describing something that was going on in the first century. All right, verse 5. The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise his authority for 42 months. He opened his mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. He was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. And he was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the book of life, belonging to the lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. Now remember, when Revelation was written, there was this expectation that people in the Roman Empire would participate in emperor worship. That they would uh, do something called uh, participating in the imperial cult, where you would go and you perform certain rituals to acknowledge that the Roman emperor was God. 
So that's probably what John is talking about when he says that the beast was uttering proud words and blasphemies. He's saying the Roman Empire was claiming to have an authority and power that belonged to God alone. And John says that the beast is going to have authority to do this for 42 months. Now, if you remember last week, this is significant because it's another three and a half. Remember that number three and a half is significant throughout Revelation because 42 months divided by 12, that's three and a half years. And I'm, I'm not going to go into detail explaining why this is, but last week I talked about it. Three and a half has symbolic significance, and it's a number that means a time of trial. A time of trial. So I think that when Revelation uses three and a half, it's not referring to a literal duration of time, but to a quality of time. And the point that John is making here, the point that the vision is making, is that the beast, his power is temporary. While the beast is in, in power, it's going to be hard. It's going to be a time of trial for Christians. But it's a set period of time that will end. Okay, It's not going to go on forever. That's, that's what I think is the meaning of 42 months. And God is going to sustain and provide for his people during that three and a, three and a half months. Now, you might say, well, Ryan, how could this just be talking about the Roman emperor? Because it says all inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. Every tribe, every language, every uh, nation and tongue. Well, that's a good point. Um, but something we have to keep in mind is that if you lived in Asia Minor in the first century... The Roman Empire definitely felt like every tribe, every nation. It was enormous. You saw that picture. Can you imagine in the first century trying to traverse the whole Roman Empire? It was huge. Okay. So I do think it's possible that if we think of this language as a little hyperbolic, um, that this could just be referring to the Roman Empire in the first century. And what John seems to be saying is that everyone in the Roman Empire is worshiping the emperor except for those who belong to Jesus. The way he puts it is those whose names are written in the book of life. Now, the next two verses are really important, and we're going to come back to those at the end because they're so important. But for now, I want to skip them and go to verse 11. And this, verses 11 through 18, talks about a second beast. There's not just one beast. Uh, there's a second beast. And once again, I want to be honest that well-meaning, well-intentioned Christians interpret this in different ways. Uh, some people say that this is saying that there's going to be a false prophet who comes in the future who sort of like runs a ministry of propaganda to prop up the Antichrist. So that's one view. Uh, the other view, the one that I lean toward, is that uh, John is talking here about the local authorities in Asia Minor who have a ministry of propaganda to make people worship the beast, the Roman Empire. Um, so, beast from the sea, the Roman Empire. Remember, looking out at the Aegean, the Roman Empire is in that direction. The beast from the land is the beast that rises up from where everybody already is, where the churches are. So that would be the local authorities in Asia Minor who use propaganda to enforce allegiance to the empire, to make people worship the emperor. So, Now, something that I want us to recognize, this is, this is interesting, is that John has basically described a satanic trinity here. The true trinity, of course, is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? Where the Father is represented by the Son, Jesus, who does uh, his will. And then the Holy Spirit directs people to worship the Son. And what we have here is Satan making a mockery or imitating the true trinity. Because we have the dragon, who is Satan, which is analogous in this unholy trinity to the Father. He is represented by the beast from the sea, which is the Roman Empire. 
And then the beast from the land, the local authorities, they function kind of like the Holy Spirit in that they direct people to worship the beast from the sea, the, the Roman Empire. So what this is saying to us is that Satan tries to imitate God. And that is a whole sermon in itself, which we don't have time for. But I want to encourage us to recognize that this morning. Satan tries to imitate God. He offers his own plan of salvation. Salvation through the spirit of empire. Salvation through government, through military power, through money. And he says, if you will bow down and worship these things, I will save you. But that's a false plan of salvation. It's, a, it's an imitation. Don't fall for the imitation. All right, so what about the mark of the beast? Verse 16 says, The beast from the land forced everyone to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark. Now, the mark of the beast has been fuel for a lot of fear-mongering and paranoia. I remember back in the early days of the pandemic, I saw someone on social media share this picture of someone getting a COVID test, you know, where they stick the swab up your nose. And they said, this is all a scheme to place a microchip up in your nasal cavity. And that's the mark of the beast. And actually, I remember uh, when I got my own COVID test, they did that to me. And, and the guy said, did that feel okay? And I was like, oh yeah, that was fine. The chip is up there now, right? And <laughs> he appreciated that. So um, People spread all kinds of rumors about the mark of the beast. Uh, you know, people say that certain vaccines are the mark of the beast. Uh, I think the new rumor these days is that when the COVID vaccine comes out, that's going to be the mark of the beast. Uh, it, its patent has 666 somewhere in it. I don't think that's actually true, but that's the sort of thing that people say. So people spread all kinds of crazy rumors about the mark of the beast. Should we give these rumors any credit? My answer is no, and here's why. Again, we have to understand what this passage would have meant to the people who first read it. And when we think of it that way, it actually makes a lot of sense because at certain times in the Roman Empire, if you wanted to buy or sell in the marketplace, you needed some sort of documentation, some kind of, some kind of proof that you had participated in emperor worship. Some kind of proof that you acknowledged Caesar as Lord. And if you weren't able to provide that, then you were going to suffer financially. You weren't going to be able to buy and sell. So that was the mark of the beast in the first century. It was proof that you worshiped the emperor. Proof that you worshiped the emperor. So if there's going to be a version of the mark of the beast today, I would say it's going to be some kind of documentation, some kind of certificate, some kind of proof that you worship someone other than Jesus. That'll be the mark of the beast. So it's not going to be something that a Christian is going to get by accident. Whoops, I got the mark of the beast. Uh, you know, I don't know about you, but no one has ever asked me to denounce Jesus or to worship the president or something like that in order to get a vaccine. So I just don't think it makes much sense, a lot of the rumors that go around saying this is the, the mark of the beast. So instead of worrying about vaccines and microchips as being the mark of the beast, I think a better application of this passage for our lives today is for us to ask, do I compromise in my faith for the sake of money? Do I compromise in my faith for the sake of money? The Christians in the first century would have felt this incredible pressure to just go along with emperor worship so that they can get their certificate and freely participate in commerce. Right? There would be incredible uh, pressure for that. Do you ever feel tempted to compromise your principles, to comprom compromise your 
uh, your commitment to Jesus in order to get more money? If so, that is closer to receiving the mark of the beast than a microchip or a vaccine, in my opinion. Now, what about this number 666? This is another big source of paranoia, right? People get worried if they see 666 anywhere. Um, people get very superstitious about that number. But there isn't anything inherently evil about the number 666. What most scholars think is that this is probably a coded way of saying Emperor Nero. And the reason for that is because in Hebrew, each letter was assigned a numerical value. So it's kind of like if you, in the English alphabet, if you said A equals 1, B equals 2, C equals 3, then you could take any word or any name and add it up. You would say, okay, each letter is worth this much, and then when you add them all together, this is the numerical value of that name or that word. And scholars say that Caesar Nero, in Hebrew, adds up to 666. So what John is saying here is that the mark of the beast is a pledge of worship and fidelity to Nero or to any emperor like him. So you're not in danger of receiving the mark of the beast if you buy something and then your receipt says $6.66. Uh, or if you want to buy a house that has the street address of 666. You shouldn't be worried about that. But what we should be worried about is who we give our allegiance to, who we give our support to. And we should be very careful not to give our allegiance to political leaders whose ultimate values are power, military, might, and money. Because that's what 666 represents. It represents political power that is ultimately controlled by those values, by the spirit of empire. I hope I'm making sense here. All right, so I know we just tried to cover a lot in a short amount of time. But to finish, let's return to those two verses that I skipped over earlier, verses 9 and 10. So John has just explained how um, everyone is going to be expected to worship the beast, and that if they don't, uh, they might get killed. And then he says this, He who has an ear, let him hear. In other words, what I'm about to say is really important, so pay attention. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity he will go. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword he will be killed. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of the saints. So this is saying that a, a time is coming, or it is now here, where if you are faithful to Jesus and you refuse to worship the beast, you may end up jailed or killed. And notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, so take up arms and fight back. He doesn't say, burn your enemies to the ground. He says, go into captivity. Be killed by the sword. In other words, be willing to suffer just like Jesus was willing to suffer. And just like Jesus, you will conquer through your suffering. What looks like you being conquered will actually be you conquering over the forces of evil. Just like Jesus, you will have victory over the dragon. As Americans living in the 21st century, we are fortunate not to have to worry about being jailed or being killed for our faith. And sometimes American Christians have a reputation for claiming to be persecuted. And I don't think that's good. Because the reality is that's kind of a 
disrespect to Christians throughout the world today who really are persecuted. Christians who, them having faith really does mean that they might go into captivity or be killed. There are places in the world like that today, and this is not one of them. Uh, just yesterday, I got to meet a pastor on a Zoom call. His name is Ellie, and uh, he's from Burkina Faso. Uh, we recently, as a church, started supporting him. Uh, he's a friend of Martha Nason's. And Ellie described how there are places in Burkina Faso where um, jihadist radicals can just, will just come into a church on a Sunday and, and kill people. And there are places in the country that he cannot go without really putting his life in jeopardy. Eli is living in a time and place, or excuse me, Ellie, is how how his name is uh, pronounced. Ellie is living in a time and place where these words in Revelation are extremely relevant. You may have to suffer. That's what these words are saying. You may have to suffer, but don't don't strike back. Don't return evil for evil. Endure patiently. God is with you. And whether you uh, live or you die, you will overcome by the blood of the Lamb. This time of trial that you're in, it's three and a half years. It's temporary. It will pass. And you will overcome by the blood of the Lamb. This week, after studying this passage and after talking to Ellie... I've been reminded of the fact that our faith is supposed to lead us to believe that some things are worth dying for. Our faith is supposed to lead us to believe that some things are worth dying for. We're supposed to believe that faithfulness to Jesus is worth it, even if it leads to suffering or death. Commitment to justice and truth is is supposed to be worth it, even if it leads to death. Do we believe that? That's a hard thing to reflect on. It really is. Do we believe that? Or do we just see our faith as a tool to help us live a long and comfortable life? Is that really what it's about? Sort of this insurance plan to make sure that everything's nice and comfortable. Is, it, do we see our faith as just a way to get on God's good side so that he gives us money and success and health? Revelation tells us that our faith is meant to be so much more than that. Our faith is meant to be a source of strength to resist evil in the world. Our, our faith is supposed to be something that gives us courage to do what's right, even when everyone else is going in the other direction. Our faith is supposed to be something that God uses to change the world. Something that empowers us to say, even if you threaten to lock me up or to plunge a sword into me, I'm not going to worship false gods. I'm not going to bow down to the God of profit uh, or, or violence. I will not bow down to the values of empire. Is our faith like that? That's the question that I want to encourage us to think about this week. And if the honest answer is no, let's start praying about that. That God would change our hearts. And in fact, let's let's finish by doing that. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, uh, we pray that these these challenging visions would awaken in us awareness of the spiritual reality that we're in, that we are in a spiritual war. And help us to remember, Lord, that what we have in Christ, what we have through you, is really worth more than anything. That it really is worth suffering to do the right thing. Lord, help us to recognize the ways that the dragon is at work and to resist. And not to resist in the kind of way where we repay evil for evil, but through patient endurance and that willingness to suffer. Lord, we thank you that we are blessed, Lord, not to have to be scared all the time of um, somebody 
killing us or harming us for our faith. And we pray for people like Ellie throughout the world who do uh, live with that uh, threat over them, Lord. We pray that you would empower and encourage them, Lord. That you would sustain them in this desert time. And Lord, help us to never take for granted uh, what we do have. But Lord, we pray that in the relative comfort that we have, that we would not be lulled to sleep, to think that faith is just uh, something to make life pleasant. It's so much more. Lord, may we have the kind of faith that strengthens us to resist evil in the world and to bring transformation. In Jesus' name, amen.
king of kings You are my everything And I will adore you Now it's the point in our service where we continue our worship through the celebration of the Lord's Supper. Here at St. Paul's, the communion table is open to anybody who believes in Jesus. And if you're not sure what it means to have faith in Jesus, talk to me sometime about that. I would love to explain exactly what that is all about. If you uh, did not receive any elements on the way in, and you would like some, raise your hand, and uh, Keith can come by and give you some. Um, We also encourage you, if you're watching at home on live stream, to find something akin to the elements in your home. Uh, One of the things that this sacred uh, ritual uh, emphasizes is that we are one in the body of Christ. When we all share in this together, uh, we are reminded of that. And we are one in the body of Christ, even if we can't uh, be in the same space right now. So, so we talked today about the mark of the beast. And there's always forces at work in the world that are trying to get us to wear the mark of the beast, right? Trying to get us to compromise and to worship something other than God. Uh, to worship the spirit of empire, to value money and power. Uh, more than anything else. And so today, when we participate in this sacred act that uh, Jesus himself instituted, I want you to think of it as, this is my way of expressing that I don't want the mark of the beast, I want the mark of Christ. I want to be sealed by him. I want to worship him above all other things. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you declare the Lord's death until he comes again. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do, but do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do, do you wish that you could see it all made new? We do. all creation groaning it is is a new creation coming it is is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst it is is it good that we remind ourselves David 
its root in the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of a blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy? Would you please rise and join for our closing song? How great is our God? Sing with me how great is our God No, we'll see how great, how great is our God The splendor of the King Let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide. He trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great! God, sing with me how great is our God. Oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God.
for being with us today, uh, either in person or on live stream. Let's say our benediction. While our service has now ended, our worship has not ended, because, because our worship never ends. Now, go in peace to love and serve the Lord and to love and serve his people. Thanks be to God. Amen.